uh, and I'm uh, um, the chairman for this webinar. Welcome uh, on the second webinar in the European Distance Learning Week. Um, yesterday we had a, uh, the opening webinar uh, with an interesting panel discussion on uh, challenges uh, about uh, open and distance learning in Europe and beyond. Today we start with the uh, topical webinars um, and uh, the topic of today is quality. Quality in open uh, uh, online and uh, technology enhanced learning. Um, the format of the webinar will be as such. We have selected uh, a couple of uh, interesting uh, speakers, presenters. Uh, um, they have prepared a short introduction on a certain aspect of quality issues in open and distance learning. Uh, they all have about 10 minutes for that presentation. Um, I invite participants uh, to just listen to these presentations one by one and uh, write down their questions. Uh, you can also use the chat box. Uh, by the way, um, I invite all participants uh, to also present themselves in the chat box uh, when, uh, just in, in a short sentence uh, what they are doing and what they are interested in uh, um, in, in this particular topic. Uh, and so you can also then put your questions in there. We will bundle the questions uh, at the end of this webinar. So after about, let's say, 45, 50 minutes, presentations, uh, we will then have time to go through all the questions one by one. Um, you can also ask your question as a participant at that moment if you think that you want to, um, to intervene with one of the presenters in particular or with the topic of quality in, uh, in, in general. Okay, um, also one remark for the participants, uh, please. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Wim, for this uh, microphone uh, during the introduction. Webinar. Uh, can I have my first uh, slide, please? Makes it easier for the presenters. Um, and then we uh, the don't have one, nasty echoes uh, in the system. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Wim. And, um, um, we have I also would like to congratulate uh, Eden for I starting this say, um, uh, European distance um, e uh, European um, uh, e learning and distance learning uh, uh, webinar uh, and uh, we. I think it was a great um, initiative, and I attended yesterday, and it was really uh, interesting. Later, and, uh, uh, in the webinar, following uh, these are okay. also very interesting topics. Um, That's yeah, you, uh, you introduced me. Uh, I would but maybe chairperson. like to, to add, uh, we have just started with Eden uh, as well, a webinar. special uh, interest group uh, about quality. And I am um, uh, pointed out what is the leader of that group. So I hope there will be a lot of interesting um, uh, events and happenings uh, uh, in the near future. Uh, so I would try to, to cover uh, something about the current challenges uh, on quality and also, and also online flexible and technology enabled learning to get an overview. Uh, next slide, please. She is with uh, the Swedish Association for Distance Education. Uh, last year, um, I was the research leader uh, on behalf will, of uh, uh, ICDE who conducted um, an international review uh, about quality models in quality online open online education online. around the globe. And uh, this project uh, was coordinated by EADTU and George Ubers, who are also uh, here today with us and will be one of the presenters. So I was the research leader, and together with the team with Ted Williams from um, UK, though, and Antonio Camilleri from Slovenia, 
and Mark Brown in Ireland. Uh, we did a study yeah. uh, about 40 quality models in OER, Luke's e-learning, online learning around the globe. And it was really an interesting uh, study because uh, although there were so many uh, different kind of uh, well-known and used models, uh, most of them um, also cover the same kind of uh, quality dimension, quality features, quality issues, uh, although they maybe were named um, a bit somewhat different. Uh, we also did um, uh, in the report uh, an overview about uh, whether those models were more norm based if, or if they were process based, if they were about accreditation, about certification, about benchmarking, about uh, frame of reference or quality. So we come up with some kind of quality matrix for that. Um, we also came up with a set of characteristics what is important to look at. And of course we were studying also the, the different kind of stakeholders because the learners have one perspective, the, maybe the, the country or the, the national authorities have other dimensions to, to look at, the institution as such. So there are different stakeholders looking at quality and uh, some dimensions are maybe the same but um, they can also differ. And um, it also depends what kind of maturity an institution are at. If they are beginners, if they are very well advanced in um, open online learning, they maybe have to focus on different kind of things. So we looked also at the macro and meso and micro level. That means um, both at course levels, uh, the kind of quality models for course levels, but uh, for the institution or for the nation as such. And we came up with a set of recommendations for stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. Um, most of the models uh, covered um, as uh, the, the, the E excellence by EADTU, um, they have a three um, main dimensions, and that is about uh, management, which covers strategic planning and development and visions, about products, about the course as such, about the curricula, course design, and course delivery, and of course about the service, student and staff support service. So most of the mod models covering those three or six dimensions. And they also looked at from the learner's perspective. And here are just some of the dimensions um, listed. For example, flexibility, level of flexibility, interactivity, accessibility, personalization, uh, transparency, particip participation. And I would like to add uh, those written in um, below about autonomy, diversity, inclusiveness, yes, for me learning, which really is a topic nowadays, how useful it is for me, about opener, uh, opener, and of course about motivation and passion for the learner, and presence from the uh, peers and also from the academics, and of course uh, what kind of purpose it is for the learner to take in the course. So those uh, dimensions are very much from the, from the learner's perspectives. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, I would say, and we would say from uh, the, my research team, that there is no single one and only quality model. Um, it depends uh, if it is a norm-based or process-based uh, quality um, intervention you would like to have. And as I said, about the maturity level, about the stakeholders, who are the stakeholders and about the level, the macro, meso, and micro. But what is really important, and what also was stressed very much in all of those models, where that um, it was it is needed to have a holistic and contextualized approach when you're looking at quality. So you can't just look at the course as such, or the service you provide for the students, for example. You need to have the whole, um, the whole area covered. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is also recently uh, a study conducted by IPTF um, about uh, uh, quality in open ed education. And um, this just came out um, uh, this year, and they have, have uh, focused on uh, four transversal uh, dimensions, and that is about leadership, strategy, technology, and quality, and six general dimensions, and that is about collaboration, research, uh, recognition, pedagogy, content, and access. 
um, you can see that those are similar uh, dimensions that I mentioned before from our study. But they also point out about uh, efficiency, uh, about impact, availability, uh, accuracy. I think something is missing here, sorry. And also about excellence. Uh, which also need to be covered with all those uh, ten dimensions. We can discuss those features uh, later on during uh, the, the session, if you like. So, next slide, please. So, uh, actually, there are more questions than answers talking about quality, because there are so many different kind of perspectives. But um, I will say, and, um, uh, the discourse the, the is uh, very much about we need to come out from those pipeline courses and also the, the, how curricula and learning outcomes and assessments are designed. Uh, they are mainly often designed in a very traditional um, campus-based and um, way. Also the kind of leadership and open online learning uh, are changing as we are going more about pedagogy, pedagogy, uh, using social media and, uh, and unbundling perspectives. And also very much is this just for me learning. What is in it for me as a learner? And that means also that the roles in a dedicational uh, arena landscape need to be changed. We, you, we need to, to uh, discuss, discuss and to um, use and to uh, collaborate with the learners. To Learners are more uh, pursue, um, not just uh, consumers, they are consumers more. Their collaborators, and that is very much about ownership and power. It is the learner who have the power. So, what kind of quality dimension do we need to look at when we are looking at that? And there's also very much about capacity building uh, within the institution, and uh, not at least the question about validation and recognition, which really is a quality dimension. How institutions are dealing with that? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, conclusion, uh, there are needs to, to rethink quality uh, as the questions um, more today are about impact, both in short time, long time, and also on personal level and social and community impact. We need to look at student engagement and satisfaction, uh, how we trace students' activity and achievements, and the efficiency of learning, and the levels of interactivity. Um, but also about uh, knowledge and skills and uh, competences as a result of learning. And of course, uh, there needs to look at faculty satisfaction uh, with their uh, conditions uh, for, for teaching and learning. But also the faculty's engagement in the uh, academic decision making. So there are a couple of other kind of quality dimensions which we need to, to look at when we are looking at quality in open online learning for the 21st century. So next slide, please. So thank you so much. And I'm very much looking forward to taking questions uh, during uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eva. Um, I think it was, it was a nice introduction to the topic of today, and and you uh, have given us uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, there are so many different models for quality in open online. And and technology enhanced learning that no one single perfect. model will uh, Yes, we have very, very purpose. difficult learning, uh, actually. And you also uh, yes, um, I will share that, with uh, you is, our experience uh, in research that took place just a couple of years ago 
And as Iba told already uh, that uh, we knew, of course, we are aware that there exist so many models in quality, uh, in quality topic in the area. So actually, what we started with, we started with a discussion on uh, uh, on the concept. We used the concept which at that time uh, used to be the broadest one technology enhanced learning because we aimed uh, and the research was actually implemented in the area of education sciences and uh, we agreed uh, among uh, the team of researchers that technology enhanced learning is the concept that covers all different different modalities and scenarios whenever we apply technologies in education and also we took approach to online learning, distance learning, e-learning and other formats and other in innovations that actually continue changing the landscape of education in Europe. That these are types of innovations. When we uh, join conferences, when we talk with professionals, uh, when we hear new ideas, new things, we all always come back to our organizations and think, how to integrate knowledge, whether it is what, what would be the challenges, what shall we do with it now. So uh, we uh, had the aim to establish the framework, how organization could look at it. And of course, uh, we don't uh, think this is the best example, but this is the example that we used and that worked with three types of organizations that we validated it in. So I will share it with you. So we had objectives for the research to identify prerequisites of integration of the in organization to describe uh, responsive and responsible integration of technology enhanced learning in organization. Responsive means that it responds to the needs of the target users of our students like long learners, adults and, and, and or better let's say learners and responsible in terms that it is actually based on some quality model or on some quality assurance procedures and other types of regulations. The third objective was to design responsive and responsible tell curriculum for target organizations and then to describe the impact of responsive and responsible tell curriculum integration in target organizations. So what impact it could have? It is very and um, in relation to quality assurance internal and externally. Um, first of all, uh, let me check if I can change myself. Yeah. So what is an up-to-date high quality curriculum design in times of digitalization? So we are talking about not replacing campus education uh, to online education. It is about the, the mix, the um, having an added value and an enrichment. Uh, to the curriculum by uh, by using online education and therefore improving uh, education. So it's not replacing. Uh, um, that first set uh, looking at elements that are of importance to the curriculum design. So what are we are we uh, looking at? We what can we do with online education um, when there are especially also more and more students uh, joining? So we can. We can uh, look at personalized teaching and learning, offering uh, students uh, learning activities and putting students on their ambitions at the center. We can create by using learning communities uh, still small scale intensive education, even if we have uh, uh, growing groups of students. We can think of uh, integrating courses and larger learning environments and therefore also uh, link students uh, with, re with research which is important for the edu uh, for academic education, of course. And uh, we can um, uh, organize open, flexible education, uh, thinking of new target groups of off-campus students, and think of cost-effectiveness by, by scale effects. And uh, in the end, it is about uh, creating a high student star satisfaction. It is about innovating education. It should be, uh, for all educators, it should be a very exciting um, exciting element in the uh, in being part of the, in the uptake of new modes of teaching. Um, going uh, online does actually mean uh, that you have to change the pedagogy. If you are going to copy lectures that are on campus by video and just presenting them online by video, it has an added value in the sense that uh, students can 
uh, watch the videos at any time, but uh, it is not taking the optimal use of, uh, of the opportunities provided by new, new modes of teaching. You should think by new pedagogies of new ways of engaging students. Um, to have the benefit and achieve economies of scale, uh, you also have to work with new pedagogies. It is so that it's not that you have more students, the teacher, professor, um, uh, will get more and more, more work, of course, then, but you have to think of new pedagogies in which students can work together, so in student peer groups, but also have students um, think about the questions to bring forward to the professor. So, so first make a selection uh, by themselves, making students part of the, of the learning process. And uh, so it, it's all about how to, to design the, core, the curriculum to make the most benefit of the um, uh, uh, opportunities by new modes of teaching. So five main challenges in designing a course, uh, this is mostly coming from Diana Lorela, is um, which learning activities should be designed for students in the course to reach the learning objectives? What is the sequence? How to support students, the learner control, and how to organize the assessment? So these are the, the five main uh, uh, challenges in, re in, designing, in designing a course. And then you can think of, and this is changing over time, of course, different uh, methods uh, of innovative pedagogies that you can introduce into your, into your courses. Um, talking about blended education, like I said, it's, uh, it's about the, uh, the combination of campus online uh, education. It is, however, a qualitative judgment on how to make the, the best blend. What is the optimal blend for a course? And that has multiple factors, like the course content, student characteristics, course objectives. So it is a um, quality judgment depending on, on the course itself. So it is, um, it's, you can't work on a matrix and, and, and build you a, a blended course like that. Um, so the design concerns further the choice of media, sequence of activities to, to come to an optimal blend of online and face-to-face -face education. Um, looking at uh, the quality assurance, then there is one typical factor of online education is that you can have an exam to, um, to check on the quality. In a smaller group, you can test what you have uh, developed and uh, only when you learn from that smaller group and uh, um, improve it from there, you, you can launch it to a much bigger group. That's not possible in on-campus education, you can do this uh, only with online education. and. Of course, you get also feedback by uh, by an online system, by learning analytics, on where to improve uh, improve the course. So this is a kind of a built-in uh, quality that you can um, make use of. Looking at external uh, quality uh, assurance, uh, you can think here about the reference in the Euro in European uh, standards and guidelines. Where do what is the role of quality assurance agencies in this? Uh, it's not literally there, but if you look at the task of external quality assurance and not ending with a report by the experts, but providing clear guidance, you also can think then in, in, the, in the near future that also guidance must be given in relation to the uptake of new modes of teaching and the quality and related to that. And also in, uh, in the, uh, the other paragraph, uh, offering features of good practice and demonstrated by institutions and recommendations from, from good practice. So, quality assurance agencies and their role is also changing with the, with the uptake of new modes of teaching. Um, a, a report, uh, a publication building on, on this, uh, actually also directly referring to the ESG, is the Change of Pedagogical Landscape Study, in which there is a dedicated chapter on quality assurance and the change of that in relation to the uptake of new modes of teaching. Um, here, there is, uh, you can read in this uh, publication that both the um, universities as well as the quality assurance agencies uh, still are in the beginning of the transition period. So, well, of course, some are way ahead, but overall, we are in the beginning of a transition period. That, and that needs to be accelerated to be fully to fully exploit the opportunities of uh, new modes of teaching and learning. Um, how to do that? Uh, the change of pedagogical landscape study comes with several recommendations. One at the governmental level, um, governmental agencies, gov uh, ministries must be aware of uh, the need to accelerate this development and encourage and not impede these developments by legislative regulatory frameworks and practices. Looking at national quality assurance agencies, they should develop their own in-house expertise to be able to also uh, 
guide universities, but also rec uh, recognize and support new modes of, of teaching. Uh, at the uh, European level, ENQA can further support the European networks by, by providing uh, expertise and sharing good practices in this field. Looking at EDTU, uh, European Association of Distance Teaching Universities, we offer three services in relation to this. One is Empower, it's uh, uh, 12 expert pools of 75 to 100 experts um, supporting universities in transition uh, on the uptake of new modes of teaching. We have the Excellence Instrument that was also referred to by EBBA on quality assurance and online open uh, flexible education. And we have the quality label for open about specifically dedicated to, uh, to MOOCs. So, thanks, so this was my last slide. Okay, thank you, George. Um, I don't know, uh, EBBA and Nati, how far you are uh, for the moment. Uh, any progress? Uh, uh. No, not um, uh, unfortunately. I'm planning okay. to chat with her. I, I also plan to send her email because uh, she sent my, okay. my email as well. But she's not communicating. Okay. Uh, can you hear us, yeah. Nati? You write in the chat. You can hear us. Maybe not. No, uh, no, um, no success so far. No. Okay, no problem. Um, we can still try fixing uh, Nati's problem. Um, there was a sixth presenter announced on the list, uh, James Brunton from Dublin City University. He actually prepared a PowerPoint set, but I don't see him on the participant list so far in the conference. Uh, so I don't know, uh, maybe uh, with time difference in Ireland or so, <laughs> that he has uh, made a mistake. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, uh, let's uh, finish here this first part of the webinar with the four presenters we have had so far. And uh, I've seen a couple of questions uh, mentioned in the chat. Uh, I invite uh, others still to uh, to continue uh, putting their um, uh, questions. Uh, but uh, if I see for the moment uh, what is in the chat, um, I think it, it was especially with Mark's um, presentation uh, when people were asking, um, how do you motivate uh, students to fill in uh, the surveys? Um, and the second question related then is, is uh, how do you then motivate the teachers to take care of uh, the results of the survey? Um, I guess that this is a particular question related to what you're doing, uh, but I, I, I assume that also the other presenters might have similar, let's say, uh, questions in mind and, and, and that they also can react on that question. Uh, but Mark, maybe you can first say a few words about uh, how do you motivate your students to fill in the survey and how do you motivate teachers then to take care of the results, uh, especially the results things that are not going well in the course. Yeah. We provide students with plenty of opportunity to participate. We send them an email with a link to the survey and we actually send that email again I think three times during the time frame of the, um, the evaluation period just to give students plenty of opportunity to respond. Um, to help lecturers um, make the most of the feedback, I've responded to Mapius in the chat. Uh, one of the advantages of using the five star system is we can quickly see which courses might benefit from a better look and managers are able to, to zero in very quickly on those courses and take a look at the part two information which uh, explains a lot of the reasons why students provided uh, such a low or high rating. Um, some of those courses too can actually be taken all the way up to academic board in a clump uh, so that um, it's not just the lecturers looking at the feedback, it's actually the organisation. But as I pointed out in my response to Mathias, it's important that managers approach the feedback from a desire to assist improvement. So it's not about punishing anybody, it's about looking at opportunities to actually improve quality. Uh, I think that's been working quite well for the Polytechnic. Thank you for that answer and it reminds me of another question that I have and that we could discuss later on with participants but I will already pose it here, uh, ask it here and uh, it was in one of Eva's slides uh, in the beginning and it's called quality culture uh, and I think that we should talk about that more uh, later on uh, I think. 
Um, thank you for mentioning this uh, and giving me the chance to introduce that question. Uh, but uh, maybe I would like first to the, the other presenters um, to, to, to give their reflections on uh, how do you motivate, uh, at the one hand, students uh, to be involved in uh, evaluations and quality assurance uh, issues, and at the same time also how do you uh, motivate teachers? Um, is anyone, Irina, Eba, or George, who would like to start discussing here? Uh, Irina, can I start with you? Yes, of course. I can give you the perspective uh, from our university, actually. And not only our university, but maybe more universities in, in Lithuania and those that, we, that I visit. Actually, I would, uh, I would uh, start with some broader issue. Uh, I think Europe went too far a little bit in standardization and uh, in quality assurance procedures in curriculum designing. Uh, on the one hand, of course, it meets um, different requirements uh, in order uh, to start uh, internationalization, uh, curriculum exchange, collaboration, but on the other hand, uh, from uh, from my observation, teachers first of all got tired from the requirements set up uh, and from regulations that actually take care of the four-year bachelor curriculum or two-year master curriculum requirements and updates, uh, which are quite frequent. Uh, this is, I think, one of the reasons why teachers sometimes are not so much willing to change their their performance, uh, their, uh, their habits, uh, their participation in the teaching and learning process. Uh, because uh, they already are stuck with the formal requirements from big programs, from quality assurance agencies, from organizational regulations and other things. So whenever they find their way and whenever it needs all these formalities, the teacher is already tired. So I think uh, uh, this also proved when all curricula was transferred to ECTS, when all the syllabuses had to be updated, when all the programs had to be, you know, revisited again. And now, for example, in Europe we go for short programs, for, for unbundling of, of, of the curricula. So we can imagine how much of this weight is on the, on the shoulders of, of the teachers. So this is actually the reason that our teachers express very often, but um, the motivation is the satisfaction of students. So uh, to reach students to provide feedback, I think one step was very successful when all the courses appear on the online learning platform. And if there is a link provided in the online learning platform, uh, which is available at any time for any student, as Mark says, we can use email or we can use online learning platform where all students log in from all over the world. Uh, in our case, this facilitated a lot and we received more, much more uh, student feedback than before uh, it didn't exist. And teachers actually are motivated whenever they see positive uh, results and positive feedback. With the negative feedback, of course there are issues because teachers get closed, but it needs time. And I agree very much with the remarks in the chat saying that we need to involve them in peer reviewing, in setting requirements, in reviewing requirements, and having communication with them. Sorry for longer. Okay, thank you. Um, but uh, I, I like what you said, uh, that uh, the motivation for teachers is the satisfaction of the students. Um, but I think that uh, it, it works vice versa as well. Um, just think about that. Eba, uh, you would like to uh, answer something here on that question of motivation for students? From the learner's perspective, I will um, stress that um, learners need to see that, uh, that there are is some, during the, the course evaluations, the course feedback, uh, or feedback in any sense, uh, they need to see that uh, there is some kind of impact and some, some kind of value for them. Uh, quite often, the evaluations are made, you know, afterwards, and it will make, maybe make sense for other learners coming come later, and uh, it doesn't make sense for themselves for their own learning. I think that is really a, a, an issue to think about. Uh, we we're talking about um, evaluations for, for learners because every learner needs to see that uh, there is some kind of impact, there are some kind of added value even for themselves. 
Uh, from the teacher's perspective, um, as you said, uh, uh, I introduced uh, the concept of uh, quality culture because uh, each of uh, each of um, staff, each of the students, uh, have responsibility for developing a, a culture of quality. And um, also, what you mentioned, Irene, I mean, sometimes there are no incentives for teachers making any change, change for opening up education or for improving education with the. Uh, Increased digitalization, etc. So then, uh, there need to be incentives, and there need to be time. And um, in one of my slides, I also pointed out very much about leadership because this is a leadership question. Leaders need to um, uh, to make time and make to make possibilities for the academics, for the teachers to um, do this transformation and to do the changes, and maybe to appoint champions or whatever, but. Um, a need to be a um, fair allocation of time, resources, uh, incentives, um, maybe awards, etc., to get you to involved in the in this uh, transformation process. Okay, I think that is already one of the answers to the quality culture. Uh, what you mentioned now, leadership uh, is, is an important characteristic there. Leadership uh, is really, really important. And for example, next week there will take place uh, the first leadership school. Uh, it will take place in Barcelona okay. and it, it, it's uh, really targeting rectors. So it will be the other yeah. and it will be really, really interesting and see what uh, comes out of that discussion. Okay. Uh, George, you would like to add here something on that discussion about motivation for students and teachers? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, the experience is that both actually uh, students and teachers are quite conservative. Uh, uh, students just want to, um, are focused on their credit points, so they want to follow the path that is set out, a bit more taken by the hand, you're not very much into uh, new things or experimenting. Uh, teachers, professors are most focused on research more than, than on education. So both are very conservative and not so much open for change. Uh, but you need both parties to make this uh, innovation and education possible. Um, for students, I guess it's best to, to work with those students because you need their voice. With those students who are open to this, to, to be um, interlocutor. Um, on behalf of the students, so at least work with student unions and uh, and and see uh, trying to get students at the table. Um, rather talk with them than maybe just sending uh, uh, lists of questions. And um, with professors, uh, we have seen that uh, professors that are open for change, it is often linked to research. Then, so if innovation in education also improves the research, then there is a win-win and then they are open for that. So if you involve students or students from abroad in improving the research and by doing that, uh, improving uh, the education, uh, that, that's the, the best mix uh, for them. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I saw one uh, reaction in the chat uh, by Lislak uh, Rissager, uh, who was also talking about uh, students are, are often conservative and, and they prefer old school teaching methods, he, uh, he or she told uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the chat box. Uh, so you already addressed, uh, addressed that issue, George. Uh, go ahead with the, the ones that are a bit more, um, let's say, uh, revolutionary in, in their approach uh, and not so conservative. Uh, okay, there was one other uh, striking question. Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, um, yeah, I think it is really, really important, um, exactly what you mentioned, George. Um, I mean, there is some kind of spin-off effects. Um, as long as the, the national authorities, or not even the ANCA, for example, are asking for this kind of uh, questions about uh, um, open education and uh, everything which follows up that, institutions uh, don't care about it. Because this very much like that, that um, institutions are doing what ANCA is doing or what the national government is doing, the national quality assurance agency, and thus the the teachers are doing what the faculty and the universities are asking for, and of course in the end, the learners are doing what the teachers are asking for. And as long as, as this process is going on, and then uh, I would mention the, the very interesting project about the sequence, which was run by EIDTU, uh, where we really, uh, it was about quality models, uh, and um, 
we we um, work also with Enka, trying to get all those kind of uh, issues into the uh, to the uh, thing. Um, and uh, actually, there is a report uh, where uh, quality dimensions are really uh, aligned with the anchor uh, suggestions for quality. So, if institutions uh, can have a look at that, I think we can can gain a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Eva. Um, I think that there was another uh, question by uh, Serfil Kochtar. Um, and um, the question there is uh, that uh, quality and accreditation is mainly focusing on outcomes of a process. Uh, it's, it's measured at the end of the, let's say, the teaching and learning process. Uh, but what if, um, um, is, is that the, the real way to go? Uh, if, do we really need to look at quality criteria uh, focusing on, let's say, the outcome of, uh, of, of a process? Or does it mean, uh, or do we also need to have uh, uh, inputs and, and the process itself uh, included in the quality assurance uh, process? Uh, I think by asking the question uh, that the answer is more or less given, uh, but uh, um, maybe you can reflect a little bit on that as well. Um, and then I uh, think that Irina's presentation was focusing a little bit on that as well, uh, talking about the uh, uh, identification of preconditions, uh, the responsive part, uh, compared to the responsible part, which is then more focusing on the outcomes. Uh, Irina, you want to develop a few ideas here on that question? Uh, Yes, actually, I'm very worried about this all the time, and because uh, on, on on the one hand, of course, uh, we have to have like promises for for the students, for the learners. We have to describe what we are going to help them to achieve. We have to clearly identify how this is consistent with what we use. So this is already, I think, embedded in, in academic community. And uh, my, if I, if I had uh, the opportunity to approach, um, to approach, you know, the quality assurance, uh, how to say, gurus and, and, and see how to change it, my only wish would be following um, so can Robinson's maybe invitation uh, leave uh, sometimes uh, teachers and academics alone. I mean, they already have these promises. They already have these frameworks. They know that they have to keep promises. If we put more trust, maybe more, I would mention Scandinavian approach because now in Lithuania we have a lot of good ideas coming from Finland how to bundle schools and education and everything. So maybe if we put more trust on them, maybe then they could focus a little bit on, on student perspective. Mm -hmm. At the same time, integrating innovations that we uh, represent uh, which is distance learning, e-learning, uh, online learning, technology enhanced learning. I don't even speak about openness now already, but but even with the classical approach of integration of technology, you you know how many uh, uh, obstacles we need uh, sometimes to uh, to overcome in order to prepare innovative, flexible, uh, user-friendly programs for students in the classical setting. Even teacher training suffers from that. So future pedagogues, future teachers, we cannot, actually in, in, in our country, we cannot teach online. They cannot have their placements online. And these are such limitations that just break, you know, everyone out of, <laughs> out of any kind of wish to, to implement innovation in, in organizations. So I think these are the obstacles that universities meet and then teachers meet. And then uh, I, I, I see this as, as one of the bigger problems, uh, but not actually the promise in terms of learning results, but everything comes to it. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else who would like to dwell around that idea of not just looking at the yeah, yeah. input? Yeah. Uh, 
I think uh, there's a huge need to develop uh, the quality of culture, to develop what um, uh, Martin um, Weller is talking about, the digital scholarship. We are talking a lot about scholarship of teaching and learning, and that is, uh, in higher education, this is really you know, a high status in education. But um, uh, I don't hear very often that um, institutions or academics are talking about digital scholarship. And that is really, really important. Uh, and exactly what you are saying, Irina, um, teachers don't even know how to how to use it and how or how to change it. And if they're trying to use uh, digital media, they're just trying to replace something. And that makes also sense to, to have this uh, SAMR, uh, SAM, SAMR model. Uh, what do you, what do you do? What are your, your uh, what do you like to, to change? What do you like to do? Uh, and I had a question here from from Gabby yeah, which uh, was had pedagogy in one of my slides, and I answered her um, um, in, in the chat box. But um, that is also we are talking so much about pedagogy, but pedagogy is uh, not changing uh, the way we are thinking about it. Uh, if we're not uh, doing this transformation and developing this digital scholarship of teaching and learning and how to use, for example, social media, different kinds of tools. This pedagogy, which I mentioned, is built on uh, Bloom's taxonomy and how to integrate uh, uh, digital um, um, features uh, for different kind of, I mean, the purpose is, it's not, it's not a question of uh, introducing uh, technology or digital uh, media, but the question is, what do you like to, to use it for? for? And that is uh, one of the topics which really, really is important for developing the digital scholarship of teaching and learning and to introduce to teachers. I think that is very much uh, lacking nowadays. Okay, thank you, Eva. Um, coming back to that question about the, the, the input-output uh, um, issue, um, George, you were also mentioning uh, that uh, it's, it's quality should not only focus on the products, uh, but should also focus on uh, the educational design uh, was one of your statements. Uh, I think that also you can agree with the fact that it's not just the outcome that needs to be measured, uh, but that we also need to, to, yeah, to see a more holistic view on, on, on quality assurance. Is that right? Yeah, so if you only look at the outcome, output, then you are actually ignoring that there can be an equality improvement in the process. And uh, of course, there can be a quality improvement in the process. And if that can be done with um, new modes of teaching, online solutions, then it should be used. It should not be duplicating what's uh, been done on campus now. But you have to uh, clearly look into uh, opportunities of online education as an added value or enriching the program and uh, only then only then use it and then use it in the optimal blend of course yeah so it's uh, now really and then the, the looking at the quality the quality of education can improve by, by doing that that's okay thank you mark um with your easy uh, survey uh, <laughs> of just 12 questions is it possible uh, to tackle both the uh, let's say the outcome issues uh, and at the same time, also looking at input and process, do um, uh, you think that is you can cover that with your 12 questions? Uh, yeah, I think it can. And it's mainly because the first two questions um, identify those courses that we need to have conversations uh, with, with the, the lecturers or faculties about. And sometimes the, those conversations will reveal a lot more than the actual survey results. So if there are some wider system problems, if there are some things that aren't captured in the part two of the survey, we know who to talk to to learn a bit more about um, how those things are impacting course performance. So I think even at 12 questions, even though it's not comprehensive, it does give you insight as to uh, who you should be talking to, which parts of the organization uh, worth entering into conversation with. Okay. Thank you. So we all agree that uh, indeed it's not just the, the, let's say, the outcomes that need to be measured and, and, and it's not just impact that needs to be measured, uh, but uh, we need, uh, when talking about quality, to, to look at every aspect of the whole chain, let's say, the whole process uh, from ideas, input, prerequisites, preconditions, uh, up to the, let's say, the learning effect with the students. Uh -huh. 
Okay, it has been touched already a couple of times, uh, the the uh, the idea. Oh, by the way, uh, I've seen a message passing from Nati that uh, she's not able to uh, to switch her microphone on uh, and that so she cannot present. Uh, but now we see her face at least in the camera. Uh, so Nati, sorry for that. Uh, we apologize. But it's nice that you will uh, make available your presentation uh, through the, the Eden websites and, and so people can at least share some of the ideas uh, and can get in touch with you later on uh, on particular aspects and issues uh, in your presentation. Um, but okay, let's move on. Uh, like I said, it has been mentioned already a couple of times that uh, Talking about quality also means uh, talking about a quality culture um, and uh, words uh, that, that have been mentioned in relation to that uh, are leadership um, and, and Eba also added uh, digital scholarship um, as, as one of the things. I've seen messages passing by in the chat box uh, where it's um, where people talk about, let's say, prof professionalization of, uh, of, of teachers, new competences of teachers uh, needed, uh, and not just of the teachers, but also, let's call it organizational competences, um, the, the competence of a whole institute uh, to, to install quality uh, measures, quality assurance, quality management, uh, in total, a quality culture. Uh, I just wonder uh, what, what the ideas are of the presenters. Uh, if we want to uh, address that issue, how do we do that? Uh, it, it, it boils down maybe to a question that we already tackled a little bit earlier about motivation of teachers and motivation of students. Uh, but I guess there is more needed than just motivate the people uh, to get involved. I think that we need to maybe transform the system, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, talk about, uh, yeah, I already mentioned the word professionalization, uh, new competences, new skills. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what the presenters think about that whole, uh, the, the, the broader picture, let's say. Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Uh, I have my own idea, but I already uh, may <laughs> I'm talking too much. Uh, so thank you. I can start. Uh, OK, Irina, thank you. Uh, I would see uh, the conditions uh, for the successful quality culture and organization as follows. Uh, well, we are groups of stakeholders, actually. And we all understand that the stakeholders come from uh, from business, uh, from uh, from academia, from education policy, and once uh, I would speak about a university. So once the university stakeholders agree upon the direction, upon the development, uh, study program portfolios, uh, forms of innovations, I think all agree upon the need then upon the resources and upon the, the time scale, let's say. So once it is agreed, it is important actually uh, to my mind that consistency is being ensured. So that I, I love actually classics a lot. And uh, if we go back uh, to different classical theories, we would see that all of them ask for the reason behind. So if there is a reason behind, and if all uh, discuss, if they have conflicts, if they have disagreements, anything, if they follow the same reason and the same need, and if it is, it once already been agreed, and if consistency is ensured, I think uh, we can talk about quality culture within an organization. So this is my point of view from, from my experience at Vigilus Magnus. Okay, thank you, Irina. George. Can I uh, ask you to, to continue on that, or uh, what do you think about yeah, the culture? In, uh, you have, of course, in a particular type of universities, and, and maybe that's slightly different from, uh, from, from other more traditional universities, although maybe not. I, I leave it up to you to discuss. Uh, yeah, of course, we have a core group of open universities, but uh, uh, there is a big majority also within our membership of um, conventional universities working with distance education. Um, 
what we uh, see in the in the uh, quality culture well it should have first of all be a, a shared concern of course of um, of all staff members and there uh, especially when you're looking at, at the uptake of, uh, of online uh, flexible education in traditional universities focusing on that on, on um the, the struggle often is, is that the uh, the management is uh, way ahead of new developments than the than the staff itself. You can guide that partly by by the quality structures. Um, it depends more, uh, maybe not the quality culture, but the institutional culture. Uh, will this um, change really really happen? Uh, we see we see very much differences between institutions and question ourselves why is it possible that this institution is so innovative and others are so conservative and and that, that uh, sometimes it depends on the subject even uh, <laughs> or the focus of that university but uh, sometimes you, you can't explain it it's, it's a culture that is there that is strengthening uh, each other um, and, and sometimes uh, when uh, professors are full autonomy almost like in Germany it's very difficult to get this change um, made. The, uh, um, so, yeah, it's more the institutional culture than, than, than the, the quality culture, I guess, that is hampering. Okay. That's an interesting viewpoint, I think. Um, okay. Um, Mark, uh, you would like to add here something? Um, yeah, sure. I, I think George's last point is a very good one. Um, I, I think ultimately quality needs to be linked to the, the purpose of the organization itself. Um, so it's perfectly possible to benchmark performance against other organizations. And I think once organizations do that, they find out where some competitive opportunities might lie for them. But ultimately, quality assurance isn't about measurement, it's about improvement. And I think the more we talk about quality assurance as a means of improvement rather than just finding out about things. I mean, what, what organization doesn't want to become better? And quality assurance provides, I think, really good ways forward for organizations to actually become better. And I think that's where a culture might find a, a common value set with a quality assurance mechanism. Yeah, coming back to what George said uh, about an institutional culture, um, you were talking about uh, a New Zealand uh, experience, let's say, uh, and now you're in the UK, in the Open University, a totally different organization. Um, is it possible for you to compare the two and, and, and to, 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 uh, to, to, well, to indeed talk about an institutional culture uh, that is then addressing the quality issues? Uh, or do you don't see that institutional culture difference uh, in, in your particular case? I think the, the organizational cultures are quite similar across the Open Polytechnic and the Open University. Um, the Open University is 10 times bigger uh, by staff numbers, and so it's a lot more complex, which, which makes it um, uh, a far more um, well, complex place to work and, and to um, apply quality assurance in. But the organizations do face very similar challenges. And I, I think, though, that the faculties, all of the staff here, would have a very common um, perspective as to the value of quality assurance. Okay, thank you. Eva, you were the one who hasn't uh, <laughs> said anything about quality. Well, you, you already introduced the quality culture in one of your slides, uh, but maybe you can come back to that uh, now here in the discussion as well. Actually, I think I mentioned uh, already in my presentation the needs of uh, this holistic approach, uh, developing uh, quality, um, uh, quality um, framework for an institution. Um, so one problem I see very much is that um, institutions are so, you know, like silos. They are the, in departments, they are in faculties, they are in IT sector, the library, they are, everyone has their own uh, responsibilities and their own budget. And opening up education is uh, transversal actions. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say maybe a bit uh, radical, but uh, I think uh, there's a lot of talk to about uh, the flipped classroom. But I really think we have to flip the whole institutions. <laughs> and that is also what I is uh, foreseeing, for example, for 2030 with this unbundling system. We are so used that everything takes place in-house, from that learners come into the, the course and everything is just in-house in, at the university in different kind of silos. We need to open up uh, a lot uh, there as well. And that is really about management, as you mentioned, George. 
uh, already by in 2013 when, when the opening up uh, initiative by the European Commission uh, was launched. Um, I don't know if it was just by chance, but one of the first uh, bullet points in their in, in initiative was about the change of um, the institute, the organization of the institutions. And um, I don't hear quite a lot about, uh, about that in, in Europe, but I think that is really, really uh, important that there need to be an institutional change. And, uh, in, um, this is really, really required. And I also, I also see, as I have done quite, uh, quite many um, uh, quality reviews uh, during the, the last year, uh, both with ITD and the, with the ADTU, but also with um, uh, PhD, when I did my PhD about quality and benchmarking. I see that institutions who are really taking this seriously uh, when they are, for example, doing benchmarking and um, to, to make improvements, not to be just, uh, as you're saying, in market, not just to assure about quality, but the whole thing is about uh, the improvement and enhancement. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you can also focus on those more uh, tacit uh, uh, features and tacit knowledge within an institution. And um, I have also the experience that um, uh, staff who were involved in the benchmarking process with the self-regulation, they suddenly more can aware about uh, the, the quality culture within the institution and also see their part of it. So again, this is very much about the leadership. If, uh, an institution would like to do self-evaluation, then it need to uh, involve all the different kind of stakeholders. I, I talked a lot about stakeholders in my presentations because there are so many involved that each of those stakeholders within an institution need to be involved because involvement is, uh, uh, is the only way we can change uh, change behavior and change change the culture. Get people involved and to have um, people opinions and to see some kind of impact. Okay, thank you, Eva. In the meantime, my camera uh, got uh, some problems, uh, and you only see uh, a grey uh, me now. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I'm still here, so uh, <laughs> apparently you can still hear me too. So that's fine. Um, the um, the one thing that that I also relate to to installing a quality culture or to 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 improve the quality culture or call it institutional culture for quality the is the the let's say the uh, the professionalization of uh, the, the the people involved in the whole process uh, teachers in the first place um, and I think uh, I was just wondering if we could. Uh, yeah, uh, give some advice on on how do we really need to um, yeah to train our teachers or to get our teachers uh, better equipped with new skills about quality issues in the, in the whole uh, yeah let's say digital world and uh, in the open and, and, and distance learning world. Um, is, is there any, uh, let's say, um, good message that we could give to the teachers uh, in, in the, the institutions? Uh, how, do, how can they get better skilled uh, for, for that? Uh, anyone an idea for this? Maybe I let you think about that <laughs> for just a few seconds, uh, and I can refer to what Nigel Jones was mentioning in the chat, uh, and that is a sort of a best practice report in the UK about uh, digital skills and, and, and how staff could, uh, uh, what kind of skills staff needs. Uh, I think that, uh, and he shared the link in the chat, uh, I think that this might be a very valuable source also to look at and, and see how uh, in the UK, at least, they look upon this uh, new skills for teachers. Um, okay, now we have had a couple of extra seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mark, maybe you can tell something. Uh, was there any particular uh, training or, or uh, yeah, I don't know what, what other word to use, uh, education for the teachers uh, to get involved in the course evaluations like you describe, or was that just taken for granted that teachers could do it uh, that way, or, or how did you do it? I, I think it was taken for granted actually, Wim, but I, I think the major challenge there, and, and in response to your question, is reassuring staff that it's about improvement and assistance. Um, it, it's, it's about actually helping them improve as educators. It's not about trying to punish them or catch them out. Yeah. It, it's really about um, 
constructively looking at those things, some of which may well be beyond their control, and trying to bring some sort of assistance to improve the situation. So yeah, coming back to your earlier point, which I think is really well made about culture, I think the more we can do to establish that type of thing as a part of organisational culture, the easier it will be to have staff participate in quality assurance construction. Okay, so you, you think that it's not necessary to organize separate trainings for that, but it, it's, it's more like that holistic view on, on, on installing a quality culture, and then people will, in a sort of natural way, uh, develop their own skills in participating. Uh. Yeah, I think so. I think that an organization can learn a lot about um, the, the framework that staff work with them, because sometimes the fault is actually with the organization and, and the way its systems work not necessarily what any individual staff are doing. So a good quality assurance system, I think, would pick up on that. So I think it's, it is about educating staff about the purpose and... Okay, thank you. George, you would like to continue on that or no particular? Yeah. It would, of course, be a pity if the, the will is is there, yeah, because that was the, the biggest problem. And when the will is there, the expertise is in there. Uh, to be shared. So I think it's important also at um, governmental and European level uh, and, and national governmental and European level to make sure that there is expertise um, to be shared um, in case that, that, that is needed and uh, also in the, uh, in the change pedagogical landscape study it is referred to the importance of having these um, uh, organizations uh, like SURF in the Netherlands, uh, is it, I believe it's JISC in, in the UK, or so, th those who are supporting uh, digitalization of education and who share this expertise. So, um, yeah, you have to do that centrally. You have to prevent that, that this would hamper uh, new developments, this lack of, sh of shared expertise. So, um, yeah, it could be very helpful to, to have that in place. Okay, thank you. Eba, you would like to say a few words on professionalization of uh, teachers, staff, management? Uh, we, we, we don't hear you very well, Eba. Um, yes, I will say again that the, the, there are needs um, to, to be incentives for the academics and for the teachers. They need to gain something for, for doing a change. As, uh, I think you mentioned earlier, uh, Arena, that Teachers are so uh, stuck up with a lot of uh, you know, duties and tasks all the time and there are not really any incentives because um, you need to, to free time and you need to also to, for example, when you have uh, new, new persons that need to be also introduced to this um, uh, if you have started some kind of new, new environment for increasing education and for the quality of, the quality of culture. Um, so to to, to um, establish champions and also, as I think you mentioned, George, there are different kind of stakeholders and there are also different kind of, uh, the micro, which I mentioned myself, the micro and the meso and the, the macro level. You need to work at all those levels and they need to be integrated as well to build this uh, quality okay, culture. Okay, thank you. Irina, that's the last one. Um, yes, I think uh, a very good example that uh, that comes to my mind actually is when uh, European projects started in life and learning program. Then, uh, of course, now we have Erasmus and other possibilities of exchange. You know, actually, some things went unconsciously. Actually, I can uh, maybe think that uh, I participate in terms of uh, additional opportunities to visit countries, to produce some deliverables, but then there's professional collaboration and some uh, outputs, uh, results that are achieved in this international setting. For me as a teacher, uh, it means uh, sharing of emotional you know, ownership of uh, some innovation that has been created together and I think uh, this brings a lot of incentives this also uh, builds uh, develops experience uh, I can share some innovative things with my colleagues it means that I'm already one step ahead and and I feel proud about what I achieved I think uh, these are successful examples from uh, from what has been um, established in, in Europe. And uh, it, it often works. 
So I think we all have internal motivation, but it is not always about additional possibilities uh, for finding things or for getting uh, some new ideas uh, from projects, but achieving some something together. We, uh, I think we can call it collaboration, uh, international collaboration, professional collaboration of teachers and building something together. So I think uh, this would be a quite successful thing uh, um, for for all things that you mentioned, actually, for for the quality culture that Mark mentioned, also for willingness that George mentioned. I think. Okay, thank you, Irina. I'm now looking at uh, the clock, and uh, it's uh, two thirty. Uh, so we should uh, finish this webinar. And I think that with the last words of Irina, talking about collaboration and talking about. Uh, yeah, a network of, let's say, people thinking uh, about same issues. Uh, that uh, Eden might be uh, one of the networks that we could uh, share, um, cherish for the, for that purpose. Uh, and as uh, Eva already mentioned, uh, there is a, a special interest group on quality issues uh, that we would like to uh, uh, to bring that idea further on uh, on the agenda of the organization. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, it's it's my pleasure to finish here this webinar. Um, and we have heard a lot of interesting things about the topic on quality in open and distance learning. Um, I don't want to, to summarize uh, the, 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 the things uh, that we have been discussing, uh, but I would like to thank all participants uh, for uh, being here with us, uh, for sharing their ideas and for being active in the chat and, and giving us input for the discussion. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again in, in the, the coming webinars. I would especially like to thank the presenters for preparing their uh, presentations and bringing in uh, their viewpoints and perspectives and dimensions of quality. Uh, a pity that Nati could not uh, give her presentation, uh, but she did her best and uh, she was also active in the chat, So, and her presentation will be available afterwards. I would also like to especially thank uh, the people behind the scenes uh, to make this possible. Uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, what we have been doing today was not possible without the help of uh, many people, especially at the Eden Secretariat, um, to help us out with this. Um, so uh, it was a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon in one of the other webinars later this week. Uh, Happy European Distance Learning Week. Bye-bye.